Gratitude is dangerous. We use gratitude to overshadow a misalignment in our lives. That's where it can become dangerous. We can use gratitude to keep ourselves imprisoned in circumstances, in cities, in jobs, in places that we simply don't come alive. Philip McKernan is an inspirational speaker, writer, and filmmaker who works with entrepreneurs and business leaders all over the world that are seeking clarity about their future or want to move through roadblocks, both seen and unseen. You know, I have a great relationship with my dad and whatever, and I go, well, was he hard on you? Yeah, he didn't show me any much emotion and he never told me he's proud of me. How much do you want to hear those words? And people will look at me sometimes and go, more than anything else in the world. Let's examine your life and what part of your life right now are you still trying to build in the pursuit and the hope of those very words? And in some cases, it's been the entire goddamn empire. I want to start with giftedness. You talk a lot about this, uncovering mm. gifts, hidden gifts. Can you just... Start with defining what is a gift, and if you could expand that a bit to some, I don't know, words or phrases to give people a sense of like, what's a gift? Is a gift speaking? Is a gift uh, loving? Like, can you define gift and give some words that might might give people examples of what gifts could be? Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make it. If you listen to me on other podcasts, I tend to try to talk about client stories or other examples, external examples. Today, I'm gonna because of the question, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with me. Um, so what is my gift in the world? It's not really for me to fully define, um, but I think there are elements of giftedness that I have been given, and I'll tell you where they came from in a, in a second. I think what people say, including my wife, is I have the ability to not just see and hear people at a very deep level, but almost feel into their lives. And that scares some people. They, 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 they move away from me. Other people go, oh my God, this guy can really see me and hear me and can call bullshit and can support me at the same time. So imagine I imagine just hypothetically for a moment that my gift is my ability to be able to actually to see and to hear at such a deep fundamental level, but to feel in to what people are feeling even beyond what they're, they're conscious of in their lives and to help them align and to, and to challenge them accordingly. Assuming that that is a, a pretty accurate description of my gift or at least an insight into it, where did that come from? So if you go back to my childhood, and I think there's a huge part of what we do in the world is we help people understand their origin story to help them understand who they are, why they're on this earth, so they can go out and make the world a better place. And if you go back to my childhood, a lot of my childhood was around loneliness. I was isolated, I wasn't seen, and I wasn't heard. So I have a saying that your greatest gift lies right next to your deepest wound. And that's why a lot of people don't uncover their gifts in the world or their core gift, which is, is this, this deep emotional sense, felt sense of themselves and how they can show up in the world. And for me, because I was lonely, because I was isolated, because I wasn't seen, because I wasn't heard, it gives me this innate ability and desire to be able to do it for other people. And another way of, 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 of describing this idea of gift and talent is you can be very good with numbers. Your career guidance person says to you in school, holy shit, Jim, you're brilliant with numbers. Why didn't you do that? And you go, great. How much does an accountant get paid? 50 grand a year. Wow, that's cool. I'm going to do that. And you spend the next 20, 30 years moving through the corporate ladder in accounting or, or even your own practice. And there's something missing. You, you, make, you do well. You, you make even more money than 50 grand. You've got 10 accountants. You've got employees. You've got practices. You've got different offices around, around the globe or North America. But there's always this sense that you haven't gotten to something. And again, the, the talent is something that you're good at or you've trained to be good at or you've learned, but it's not necessarily your giftedness. And so that's how I often describe it. My wife was an accountant and now she's moving into coaching and speaking and stuff for that. And you can see the talent disappearing and the gift starting to emerge. And that is her ability to, um, to hold space for people to allow them to get in touch with their individual brilliance so they can show up in the world in a different way. You mentioned that it's all, and that was amazing, not really for you to define. Who is it to define? Who does define it for you if it's not you? The key to life, it isn't money, it's happiness. And when you measure how happy you are, you actually become even more happy. Our friends at GoBundance, the tribe of millionaires, use a very specific tool to measure their happiness. It's called the Life Happiness Index, and you can have it too. 
Go over to GoBundance.com slash LHI and take your life happiness index assessment. You'll rate yourself in multiple categories on exactly how happy you are and get a custom output for you specifically that you can use in developing whatever goals you have for your life. GoBundance is the tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous people who choose to live epic lives. And the tool GoBundance members use at the base of all of that is the life happiness index. Get out there and grab life big. Yeah, I mean, I could define it. it. It feels like, to me, a gift is on loan from the universe, and our job is to be the best stewards of it. And when I pass away or I abuse my gift, it is taken from me and is given to somebody else, or it just it passes on to other, other people, in a, in a, you know, not in a religious context, but it could be for some, but for me, energetically. So I, I have been personally reluctant to define it because I think it's ever moving. It's shifting as I shift. You know, we're going through a phase right now where we've been doing retreats and working with leaders and everything else and working with couples and doing one last talk. And we're beginning to, to, to kind of hone in or pivot. Who, who, what is the conversation I want to bring into the world over the next five years? And therefore, who do we want to have that conversation with? So therefore, I don't want to over-describe and over-define and, and my, my gift. I just feel it's not my place to necessarily over-describe it and to tell the world, here's where my gift is. It feels like an arrogance um, that, yeah, I just don't want to play with it. It's very sacred. So it's it's fluid and it's for other people to feel and identify in me, if that makes any sense. It makes a ton of sense. And it's interesting as I, I'm, I'm, I always try to like lay myself into the words that you're talking about, any guests that I have on. And uh, that really hit me. I mean, you talked a lot about me, you know, you're good with this, go do this job, do it for 20 years, but there's something missing. I described to you, mm -hmm. you know, I left a big job a couple of years ago, you know, searching for that something missing in that journey. I feel like defining my gift was something that I was able to do through a lot of work uh, or at least put words to it in some way. But the harder part was maybe the admission. In other words, defining it and saying it to myself is one thing, but then I trip into, is it egotistical? Is it arrogant? Is it those things to then admit that I even have a gift? And I'm wondering for me, how much not admitting it or not having the confidence to admit it or not just being in a receptive mode in order to say, okay, this is what I got and I can share it held me back from leaning into my gift. Does that make sense to you? Does that resonate? It, it, it makes total sense. I mean, I often think that, if you use the analogy of book writing, and I know a number of your clients have written books or want to write books or will write books, you know, you think about, you know, your front left pocket, your front right pocket. And let's just say your front left pocket is your, your corporate job that you, you talked about leaving and say, well, what do you do? And you take out a card that says corporate job and whatever your title is. So, well, what do you want to do? And you go to your right pocket and you take out, you know, some sort of entrepreneurial endeavor or some sort of impact driven concept or whatever. And I go, great, they're brilliant. It's fantastic. And you say, well, can we talk about the fears I have about the one in the right pocket and how I transition and the clarity? You go, yeah, we can do that. And we can waste some time doing that. Or, I'm really interested in what's in your back pocket. You go, what do you mean? And I go, well, what's the idea that no one gets to see? What's the idea that no one really knows about? And you go, oh, it's just, it's, it's nothing. You mean there's something, it's just nothing to you or it's it's not yet for it. Yeah, it's just this little thing, you know, it's, it's, it's no big deal. But can we just go back to the right pocket and go, no, no, no. And you reach into your back pocket and you take it an idea and it, it could be written in a car, but generally it's just verbalized. That's just this thing I I, I, I thought with. And I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with that idea. And and I know the, the mountain analogy is, is done or overdone. But to me, there's those, to me, there is, and I know the book is the second mountain is written, but I've been using mountain analogies for many, many years. But I think there are three mountains there. The first mountain is about survival and getting to a financial place. The second mountain can often be a business that is heart centered. In other words, you know, well, we've got 50 employees and I'm, I'm, I'm helping these 50 people put bread and butter on the table and put mortgages on the table. And every year we make a hundred grand and I give 50 grand away and we build an orphanage in Peru. And that is, that makes me feel really good. And it'll still never be enough because if you're not doing your soul's work, which is the final mountain, like the real true expression and essence of who you are, there will always be this sense that you didn't fully live, that you didn't fully show up. And this idea, this hauntedness that I have of this walking around a, a corner one day or walking around the side of a mountain and bumping into the person you could have been. And that soul work is the thing that I think we should obsess about and explore without over obsessing, but obsess about and pursue because what's just beyond what you're doing right now. And the, and the question I often ask people, when I give you this question, does it enlighten you and light you up or does it scare the shit out of you or does it make you angry? And the question is, is your greatest work yet to come? And if your answer is fuck yeah, not, not because you should say that, but 
oh my God, yes, yeah, yes, it is. Is it, oh God, you mean, and you interpret as, oh, you mean what I've done is not enough? That's your mm-hmm. shit, not mine. Right. Or you go, oh my God, that's so exhausting. I can't even figure out what I want to do next year. Never mind, is my greatest work yet to come. So how you receive that question is very insightful into where you are and how open or how enlightened or how exhausted you are in life. To me, I'm 51 years old. I think I've landed in the general vicinity of what I am destined to do and why I was brought into this earth. Some days I wish I had a different upbringing to some extent. And I could sit here and say, which I'll never do, it could have been worse. But no, for me, it was the worst. And yet it has given me this giftedness that I have an obligation and and an opportunity to bring out into the world. But I'm only getting warmed up. And some people look at my life, they go, God, you've achieved extraordinary things. And maybe I have, but it's not, it's not about me. My journey is not about Philip McKernan. My greatest work is yet to come. And that to me excites the shit out of me. How do you stay in that? How do you stay in that space where, you know, your, your, your job or your, your gift is here for you to serve others with essentially is what I heard. How do you stay there and not slip into the other side of it? Like, how do I gain from this? Oh my God. What a question. Oh my God. What a question. What a question. What a question. You don't and you can't. And the expectation to stay in that, call it a lane, is where we become complacent, maybe become arrogant around the edges, and we become a little bit unaware. To me, I call it slippage. So I did an interview about four years, three years ago, and the first guy, I felt so bad for the lady. She had done so much research on me. And our first question is, Philip, how did you become so authentic? And I said, you're making an assumption that I am. And she goes, you're not. And I said, I think and I believe, but ask the people that live with me, please, because that's the best indicator. I believe I'm more authentic than I used to be, but I'm not even close to where I want to be. Same. And I'm not even on an eight. I'm not even a nine. I think I'm on a six and I'm hopefully heading in the right direction. So to me, I call, I call what the question you asked, I call it slippage, that there's, there's always this slippage of my ego kicking in, my 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 insecurities, uh, you know, uh, you know, penetrating, you know, who I am, and try to get in and manipulate my brain, overthinking and creating paranoia. There's always this slippage, and if I'm aware that I'm not always in that lane, and I don't expect to always be in that lane, I think then I'm on on on. on I have a sharpness. Um, to me, my work, people often give me lots of accolades and 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 kind words, and it's lovely, and it is genuinely lovely to hear because. It's important to know that you're doing something in the world that matters. At the same time, I feel my work is coming through me. So therefore, it's not from me. It's coming through me. And I'm not a very religious person, but I'm very spiritual in my own way. So therefore, I I try not to take ownership of what I do. I mean, I got an email the other day, and you're the first person to hear this. And I wasn't going to share this with anyone in the world. And out of context, it might sound very arrogant and self-serving. I worked with a couple a number of years ago, and uh, we did a lot of very important work. Work that I felt if we didn't do might have caused some problems later on in their marriage. And I got an email the other day, and the, basically the email talked about how we, myself and my wife, the work we did saved their marriage. And at the end, he wrote, he said, we just had a new baby boy, and we called him Philip after you. And I won't lie, it it was mind-blowing to hear it. Like it was so emotional, so it, it, it's indescribable in many ways, but, 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 but it, it just felt so beautiful and so pure. But at the same time, I can feel the ego wanting to go, yeah, let me, come on, let's feast on this. Let's own this. Come on, let's meditate in this. Let's high five and jump in. And unfortunately in society, People want to put you on a pedestal. They have no right to put me on a pedestal. I didn't ask for that. I don't deserve that. And the minute you put somebody on a pedestal, an inch high or a mile high, all you're saying is, I'm not good enough. I'm not as good as you. So to me, it is so important that we stay grounded. But don't ever, in my, I'm, not, I'm, not teach, I'm not telling you, I'm not lecturing you, but I will never, ever, ever, ever feel that I have stayed in that lane. There's always slippage. There's always leakage. And the more I'm aware of that, the more I can keep myself honest. Where are you inauthentic in your life right now the most? When I ask that question, what pops up? Um, I think 
I'm known for being very vocal and no bullshit and saying things as I see them. But I still think I hold back. I still think there's that remnants of caring too much what other th- other people think. Yeah. Um, it's it's way more insignificant than it used to be, but it's still present. It's the, you know the idea that oh my god, what if my dad hears the podcast or whatever? Right? I'm just I'm using that as an example. The fact that that, that is even somewhat present means I've got a foot on the accelerator and I've got my other foot resting on the brake. And I just, I just feel like there's this truth, this, this conversation that's trying to come through me and it is coming through, but I'm kind of holding it and blocking it. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's my, my initial answer, my off, off, off the bat. Where are you afraid to go? Meaning if you were to take your foot off the brake, what do you, you know, that back pocket card. Yeah. What do you see Philip McKernan becoming potentially? Like what is the, what's the, the upper I, limit of you if you took your foot off the brake? I know exactly. I, 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 I'll tell you, I mean, I, I've never been asked this question before, but I, I see a, a really potentially a really large amplification of me in the world. And I love helping people, but I also have this really deep genuine desire and it serves uh, a genuine fear that I have that if I become too amplified, I'll become lost and that my ego will take over and that I will, will go down a path where I'll become disconnected from myself and I'll do the work for the wrong reason. There's a purity to what I do and a, and a privilege to what I do that, that I love. Um, and I've seen way too many well-known speakers go down a certain path with great intention. And this might come across as unprofessional, but Quite frankly, I don't care because this is the truth because I've met many, many of them. And there would have been a time where I'd sit in an audience going, oh, my God, imagine being them. And maybe slightly embarrassingly to say, but God, maybe not using this question, but maybe feeling this, God, what would it be like to have that life or be them or whatever? I wouldn't use that language, but it would be the feeling. And this is many years ago. And then I'd meet them. And I'd often meet these men and women, and, and some of them were very genuine and beautiful and grounded. But 95% of them don't live the life they say they do on stage. They're not even close. And, yeah. and, and I know that, again, this is going to an audience that are probably not just open to going to conferences, but do go to conferences and everything else. Um, and they may disagree with what I've just said. And they might, they might think, oh, I'm just jealous or I'm whatever. Um, and, and, you know, again, but, but what I would ask, always ask somebody is just check in what you're feeling. In, in front of any, where you're reading a book, listening to a podcast, or watching somebody on stage, forget about what they're telling you and, and feeding your intellect. Just check in with your gut and go, do, do I align with this person? What they're saying and how they're saying it. Does it feel deeply, intuitively right before I decide to take on their strategy and, and build my life around it or integrate it into my life? So not, ex- not an area I expected to talk about today or any day for that matter publicly, but um, yeah, we're not overly worried, but but conscious that that is that is that is a place that I could end up, and I don't want to go there. Let me ask this: If you're, I I can cons- I contemplate this all the time, and if it's too deep or whatever, just tell me. Ah, eh, move on. <laughs> but I think about ninety three, ninety four, ninety five year old me, last day kind of guy, and that exactly what you just described the fears that I might have then. And I always say like, oh, only I know that guy. Only you know 90-year-old Philip McKernan, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody knows him other than you. And if he walked in the room right now, I, I believe this in my soul. You know exactly what he would say to you. Advice, counsel, whatever it would be. So you're between, it sounds like, and this is just fascinating to me. So thank you for indulging this. You're between this space of like, okay, you've got, you've, you've, built, a, you've built significance in your field. You have a reputation that precedes you. Uh, however you feel about your authenticity, obviously nobody can define that for you, but uh, it is what it is, right? But you've come across at least as being very authentic, very vulnerable, very willing to give. You you wear the brand that you speak of. That's my assessment at least. So if you're 95 year old you and you're faced between two fears, he walks into the room right now. Fear A is that you, you get so big and lose yourself or lose a portion of yourself into ego or whatever it is. But I would guess make an impact. And fear B being you never went there. What is 95-year-old you laying on, on your deathbed, last breath, if you leaned in and he whispered into your ear, what does he say to you? Today, right now? Right now, if he whispered I'm, into I, your ear. I am so fucking proud of you. 
Yeah. What is he proud of? The courage to go from sitting in a classroom in school with your head down because you were afraid someone's going to ask you to speak and so ashamed of who you are and so embarrassed about who you are to holding space for humans all over the globe and helping them see how beautiful they are and how beautiful they can be and helping them uncover their individual gift and impacting the world. Will it matter to him whether you became the biggest version of that or not, meaning no. the most reach? No. Not Impact. in the slightest. He he might go, and if you've got time, just give me one story. Tell me one. Just tell me one story and own it. And it's so funny. I, I almost declared to myself I was never going to tell anybody. I only shared that with about 10 people. Um, there's a, a small group I work with, and I just shared it with them because they all want to coach and they all want to make an impact. And I shared it through the lens of saying, just as a reminder of the impact that we can make in people when we get out of our own way. Hmm. And my wife, and now you and your audience. Um, so it's interesting that that I share that today, and I had no intention. I did an interview yesterday, and I could have shared it, but I no, I, I didn't want to share it, and it didn't feel right to share it, but energetically it felt right today. Um, but he would be incredibly proud of me, and he would just want to hear one little story, one bedtime story about how that actually transpired in real life. Um, yeah, and that would be it. And it would be nothing to do with scale. Nothing. Staying on this for just one more question. Does 51-year-old Philip ever go to 9, 10, 11-year-old Philip to tell him how proud he is of that boy? Historically, not enough. But I had a profound experience last year. Like absolutely one of those, I've had probably three or four really profound experiences in my life. Some that I can explain why they were profound and how they affected me. Others, they just don't make sense. And I'm walking an ancient road. Um, it's it's called a green road and it's about a 5,000 year old road. And it's just on the mountain over to my left here. As I look out over Galway Bay and the ocean and the Atlantic, uh, literally outside my door, I'm very fortunate. Um, but over this hill here, you know, maybe you know, an hour, 40, 40 minutes walk, maybe 10, 50 minutes drive, you can get up into this ancient road. And it would have been the old roads they would have used maybe thousands of years ago. And I was walking that road and I had a group of clients behind me. They were on a, this week long retreat with me. And I found myself um, walking and I, I just had this incredible sense that there was somebody walking beside me <clears throat> and yet the clients were behind me. And I'd ask them on this occasion to either walk in silence or to contemplate something or to walk in twos and, and share or whatever the, the context was. And I found, I found this incredible moment where there was somebody walking beside me. And I, and I, and I, I didn't even, need to, I didn't even need, need to look, but it was essentially my nine or 10-year-old self. And he was just walking beside me. And I know some, some of your listeners will probably go, okay, I'm out of here. I, he's just lost me now. Uh, potentially, I don't know, but it was it was absolutely stunning. It was like he and I've done inner child work. I've done therapy. I've done it on and off for many many years. I bring people into some of those those conversations myself. But this was the first time that he truly showed up, and I didn't ask or try or work. He just walked up beside me, and all he wanted me to do was hold his hand. And I reached out and held his hand. And then I found myself almost kind of, almost skipping down the road. And it was so moving and so profound that I stopped as, 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 as it kind of came to an, it wasn't an end, but an ending, so to speak. I stopped the group. I let them all gather up behind me. And I decided I meant to share this. And I shared this with them and I invited them into an exercise, not, not, not intellectually purely based on emotion. And that's a lot of my work is not based on an intellectual framework, even though I have frameworks. It's more about feeding into what I'm feeling in the group and trying to meet and honor them where they are and the conversations and the experiences that they need to experience. And I know some of the clients as a result of what I was gifted in that moment. And by sharing that, and again, this is the idea of the work coming through me. Mm. They had some of the biggest insights or breakthrough, whatever you want to call it, but just 
experience something magical. Not every one of them, but a large proportion of them. Um, so he showed up that day and that was, it was incredible. And I feel he's been ever present ever since, but not, 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 you know, in a light way, not, not ever present in that regard, nor do I feel the need to run up to the mountain and try to recreate it. Uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. I'm not, I don't think I did a great job explaining the power of it. It was just profound. Well, let's go a little deeper on that. What What is it about that that has shown up in your life? You mentioned he's, uh, you know, this light energy that you have around you now, but how has that changed anything for you or how how are you seeing things now differently than maybe you did then before that experience? Yeah, I think I think it was, now that you're asking me the question, I think it's part of this process I'm going through right now where I'm reevaluating not 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 throwing everything out the out the window and throwing everything away. Um, still working with people who want to make an impact, um, but I'm 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 shifting into what is the conversation? It's back to this thing I alluded to earlier on. It's like every five years, if I don't, and I haven't done this for at least five years, if not longer, but every five years, I need to just stop and just reevaluate. Okay, well, is 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 am I am I in alignment here? Is because I find sometimes we don't take the time to allow our work to catch up with who we are as we evolve in this world, assuming we're all evolving albeit at different rates. And, and I've, I, I've, I've, I've lagged in that regard. So what's emerging is a deeper narrative. Uh, for example, um, people, clients would say to me, oh, your, your work is very deep and it's, it's hard. And I would go, yeah, you know, it is. And, but, but you know what, it's, 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 it, you know, it'll be rewarding and it, it's, it's valuable and it's whatever. And I go, and now I go, you're fucking right. It's, 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 it's deep. And I'm not going to apologize for it because the deeper you go, the higher you fly. I'm not going to apologize for it anymore. And is it hard? That's all relative. But I'll tell you what's hard. What's hard is not doing this work. That's hard. Because what happens is you never get to the essence of who you are. And the world doesn't get to see the essence of you. And your gifts don't get out and come out and play. And they don't get to dance in the rain or in the sunshine. And that is a tragedy. And by yeah. the way, it's not about you. I used to do some work with couples and every five years or three years, we do a little couples retreat and it's wonderful work. And it's a pain in the ass because trying to get two people to agree because one goes home and says, hey, honey, I want to go on this brave couple retreat with this Irish guy and go, well, what's wrong with this? Well, nothing really. Well, then why do we need to go? But no, but there could be if we don't work on ourselves the same way as we paint the house, you know, or whatever, or service the car. And, and it's just this pain in the ass experience. And people say, well, why do you do it? And I go, you haven't thought about that. And I said, I really don't give a shit about the couples. When I think about it, of course I care. I care deeply about humans. I care more about people than they care about themselves often, which is probably at the core of what really drives a lot of the problems and the suffering in the world. But in actual fact, it's not really about the couples. I don't give a shit about them. But the beneficiaries of that work is their children. Hmm. So when I work with a couple, I just see the impact. When I work with an individual who has got this incredible gift, they don't own it, they can't see it, they don't want to see it. They can't see how they're brilliant. And they're not open to this idea of a gift and an impact because they're so fucking scared and they're whatever. I go, whoa, whoa, this is not about you, buddy. Stop making it about you because I'll often have people standing on a you know a stage and, I, and I'll, 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 I'll always do q and I always have interactors and they go, well, I'm stuck and I'm I'm not clear and I'm whatever and I'm whatever. And how would you get me to? And I, because there's one common problem with that whole fucking statement and all of those questions. And that is I and me. Stop making it about you. Hmm. Stop making it about you. And I'll give you a quick example. I was invited to volunteer in a prison to work with inmates who um, are reforming and have genuine regret for what they've done and want to make a change. And it's an entrepreneurial thing where you, you, you sit in these little panels and people come along, they pitch these businesses and they get through different levels and they can get to the final and they get 25 grand to fund a business if they ever get out of prison and they get mentoring and everything else. And they come along and they pitch their businesses and we, myself and three other entrepreneurs, are help them tweak their presentation essentially. And this young man comes up and he, he, he basically wants to open up a gym. And he goes, yeah, I want to open up a gym and, uh, and, and this is the, you know, what's going to be and this is the marketing, the brand, and this is how we're going to leverage it and grow it and, 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 and expand it and everything else. And the first entrepreneur says, yeah, I like it. I just bit more information on the finances and the second. And none of this is wrong, by the way. The second entrepreneur is, I love it. I, I love the name. I'm not sure about the logo. The third entrepreneur, whatever. And I, I just turn around. I said, don't get it. He goes, excuse me? I said, what bit do you not get? It's the whole thing. Another goddamn gym. Great. 
I said, but why? He goes, well, the why doesn't, isn't important. I said, well, it's important to me. And he goes, and he looked at me and I said, why do you want to open up a gym? He said, my grandmother died of obesity. And with tears rolling down his face, he said, no one needs to lose their grandmother as early as I did when it comes to something like obesity. And I said, where the fuck is that in your presentation? He goes, oh, it's, there's no place for the personal stuff. I hear this in the corporate world and I hear this in life. And I said, if you don't put it in, I'm telling you, and I spoke to him like he would expect to be spoken in that environment. He said, you're a fucking idiot. He put in this why. He got through to the final. He stood on stage in front of hundreds of people, inmates and everything else, and entrepreneur uh, um, volunteers and the judging panel. He won the outright competition. And that's not the important part here. When the judges were asked, but what was it about his presentation? And every one of them said in their own unique way, ultimately, it was about that he had a compelling why. If you don't understand Impact is not enough. If you take impact and you can impact the world, great, and I applaud you. It's brilliant. Writing checks, building places, whatever it happens to be. But if you can align impact to your own individual gift, your own personal narrative, you can align those two. If you've got a why that is built on some type of suffering that you yourself have experienced, there's, there's a, it's like going from, it's a different type of fuel. It 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 it's it, it's often drive can can run out, but this 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 can't be diminished. It's a it's a it's like a, I have to do this, and my job is to help people align to what that is. And when you help them align with that is impact is just it's just given. It, it it's just a have to. It's not a case of a want to anymore. I don't know if I'm rambling now. If I've lost it. Um, but this is, this is why I'm on this earth, to help as many people understand at their core why they're here. Understand not just intellectually, but emotionally their gift. And that's why we think soul set is more important or is least equally as important as mindset. And then go out and bring that to the world to end suffering or at least diminish some suffering for as many people as you can before you leave this earth. That is the greatest form of wealth that exists in, on, on this planet as far as I'm concerned. That's beautiful. And no, that was not rambling. That was, uh, there was a lot there. I wrote down a bunch of things. What's coming to me though, is this question, and then we can unpack it a bit. I think you mentioned about, uh, impact aligned with your gift uh, and that story of the inmate and his grandmother and so on. Do our gifts or are our gifts all rooted in pain? They're all rooted in the past. That's for sure. And the ones that are the most tender happened to exist in a place where you had some type of suffering, call it pain. So the answer to that question is essentially yes. When, now, when you when you've got somebody, so sorry, continue, please. No, please go. go when ahead. you've got somebody, for example, we had a business owner who came to Ireland a number of years ago, successful entrepreneur, and he and he, he it was kind of. Not the perfect client initially, because it was like, oh, I'm going to do this brave soul thing because I've heard a lot about it and it's my 60th birthday and I'm going to just do this thing. And he came and the first couple of days, it was like how perfect his childhood was. And I got to a point where he felt awkward about it. And he just came up and he said, Philip, he said, can I have a word? And I said, of course. And he pulled me aside privately. He goes, but like, I, I had an amazing childhood. And I said, great. He goes, but, but I said, well, what's the problem? He goes, well, kind of people aren't saying it. They might be feeling bad. They're just looking at me and I'm kind of questioning myself. And I'm not looking for negativity. I'm not looking for shit. I'm not looking for pain. Now, what I'm saying is I'm creating a space to experience the joy and understand the beauty, but also honor the pain because a lot of us don't want to look at it. But in that pain is so much of the growth that a lot of us eludes a lot of us because we're unwilling or unable or resistant to going back and looking at that. and. He just said, well, what do I do? And I said, you, were, you had a perfect child. He goes, yeah. And I said, if, can I ask you to do one thing? He goes, yeah. I said, just question it. I said, can you do that? He goes, yeah. And up to this point, it was I cycled my bike. I was free as a bird. I had anything I wanted. I could go anywhere and be anything. And I think that set me up for life. And that's why I'm such an amazing entrepreneur. And that was a great story. But it's a construct to protect himself from the disconnection and the pain that he felt. He came in the following morning. This is not one word of a lie. His name was Scott. 
He came in the following morning and he sat in the room and he put his hand up as if he was in, in, in a classroom. I said, Scott, you don't need to put your hand up in my room, but you did. What can I do for you? He said, can I share something? I said, absolutely. He said, the last two days I've been talking about how great my childhood was. It's total bullshit. And you could feel the pain in him. And he said, I just got in touch over the last, last night and this morning. He said, I was just so lonely. He said, I was on my bike cycling everywhere because I was just looking for friends. I was on my own. Now, here's the magic and the power of that is number one is he gets to understand the truth about his upbringing and his existence. Secondly, he gets to see how that is perpetuated now and penetrates so much of his life. And how he tries to protect himself by creating islands and creating this open door policy in his business, which he also said was bullshit because he said, you can come in the door and tell me anything I want to hear as long as it's what I want to hear. People were scared of him. He was disconnected from his wife. He, he blocked his heart. He put the Great Wall of China around his soul so his kids couldn't really penetrate. And as he bawled his eyes out in front of him, he goes, he goes, I want to, I want to let them in. I want, I want them in. But he would never have seen that. He, he held onto that story so tight. We create these stories to protect ourselves. And that's fine. That's what the brain, that's why the brain, I don't trust my brain 100%. It's, it manipulates and it's so powerful. And if we can help, my, my singular job in the world is to help people drop out of their heads, connect with their, with their own heart, connect with their soul, connect with their, their story, connect with their, 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 their self sense of themselves beyond the narratives that we've told ourselves and the constructs that we've created in order to protect ourselves. And all I asked him to do was, can you just challenge the story? That's courage. We play, we, we, we in society applaud people for execution. <laughs> oh my God, you see what that guy did? Do you see what that girl did? And no disrespect, that's, that's wonderful. So for example, I'm, and I'm just spitballing here, your, your podcast. To me, it takes a lot of courage to put anything out into the world particularly in a public domain. So people might go, oh my God, launching a podcast. Well done. That is amazing. 50, 50 episodes, 7,000 episodes. Until your man McKernan came on, it was epic. But I mean, I, congratulations. I go, no, that's not a lot of courage. That's just execution. Courage comes when you wake up one day in corporate America or corporate China, wherever you worked, and you go, what if this is not for me? Mm. That's courage. To have the courage to question what has historically been normalized in your life that can be both beautiful and dysfunctional, and it can be equal and it can be more than one than the other. To have the, the, the courage, the audacity to stop and to question what you and others think is normal. That's courage. What comes from that is a byproduct. I love that. I love that so much. You're... you're you're opening up a line of questioning here for me with with the kids, the 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 gentleman Scott that that had this epiphany that wow, I was a lonely kid, and I'm going back to you talked about working with couples. The idea of working with couples is you're focused on the kids. I would assume, and maybe I'm wrong, that it can't be that you're working with couples so such that they can avoid any pain for their kids on behalf of their kids. That's just not pain and trauma often is, is how it's interpreted by the individual. It's not, you know, like the physical of being raped or molested or, or murdered or, well, attacked or whatever it might be. Yeah. So then what is it with kids? Is it that, is it parents work with their kids such that kids know how to be courageous and asking the right questions about their life? What is it that you're seeking to, to do with couples in, in as far as serving children, what's the outcome that you're craving okay. or seeking? Specifically, right? and by the way, we don't have an outcome on the website. We don't have an outcome on the promise. It's something that I've become very aware of recently that actually the thing that lights me up the most is that if these, if this man and this woman work on themselves as individuals and become a better version of who they are and their relationship is better, their children get to model that every single day. And I'll give you a quick example. And there's one other element if I can retain it and remember it. So I remember speaking at a, uh, at a conference with six, seven, eight hundred people, something like that. And this man put his hand up. He's OK, OK, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get a misalignment and working somewhere that kills you and uh, d diminishes you and eats away at your soul. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. I go, is there a question? And he goes, well, what, what should I do? And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I was looking at him. I could assess straight away. There, was no, there wasn't enough pain. He got it intellectually. He got the idea. 
but there wasn't enough pain for him to move. And unfortunately for most people, not all, they need the pain. They need to go through the shit before they realize, oh my God, I need help. I need to ask for help. I need to ask for assistance or whatever. Most. And I just looked at him and I said, I said, I don't think the pain is bad enough. And he goes, oh, no, 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 it is. And I said, for for how long have you been in this in this position? And he goes, 16 years. I said, excuse me? And he mumbled it again. He said, 16 years. And I said, so I can't hear you. At that point, I could hear him. He goes, 16 years. And, the, and that last one, he got really angry. And I said... I don't, I don't, I don't think the pain is, is, is just bad enough. And he, and that drove him completely nuts. Like he hated that comment. And I says, clearly you won't do it for you. Hmm. Clearly that's what you feel you deserve. Clearly it's okay to punish yourself because that's, that's, that's been normalized for you. But I wonder, and then, and ideally you do these things for you, but I wonder, could you do it for your children? He goes, what do you mean? I guess, give me the name of one of your kids. And let's just say his kid was Sarah. I said, let's fast forward to when Sarah is 25, 28, 38, whatever, and she comes to you. You tell me what outcome you want. Dad, I'm working in a firm. They don't treat me very well. They don't respect me. But most of all, I'm not coming alive every day. What would you say to her? And, he, and, he, and, and the last syllable wasn't, hadn't even left my mouth before he goes, Sarah, j- j- just leave. Like, j- j- don't, don't. You, you are worth more than that. Put a value on your own skin. You're gifted. You, you, they, they don't deserve you. You don't deserve them. Go out into the world. And he didn't even know what he was saying. And people were going. And then he's caught himself. And he goes, <gasps> and he looked around. He goes, <gasps> uh, 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 like, he, it was almost like I was caught out. And then, of course, it landed. And I said, so he, here, here's the invitation. Sarah will do one of three things. She will come to you and she will say, Dad, either, sorry, one, she won't come to you because you're not the best advisor in this regard. Two is she'll come to you and say, Dad, what do you think I should do? And you'll go, leave, leave, leave. You're beautiful. You're amazing. You're creative. This is not the place for you. It doesn't bring you alive. And deep down, intuitively, she'll go, mm, yeah, I know, Dad, but you kind of did it. I, I, the, she may not put these words to it, but, but this is what you did. And you're still there. And, and you never left. And she'll question it to some extent. Or three, she doesn't come to you at all. Do you know why? Because she's already left. Because she grew up with a man who was unprepared, unwilling to sacrifice his own soul for a place that didn't value him or vice versa. She doesn't even have to come near you because she's born and brought up in the very school and being schooled by purely witnessing you. That is the inspiration. It's not about doing it for your children. Be the thing that you want your children to to do. The second part of this, and this is really obnoxious, but I'm going to say it anyway. The second thing I, I, when I work with parents is to let them know that no matter what you do, you're going to fuck your kids up. Yeah. And what I mean by that, just so people understand, is it doesn't mean you give up on them, but you let go of being perfect and trying to control the outcome. Hug them too much, they need therapy. Never hug them, they need therapy. Anything in between, they're going to need therapy. So you assume you're going to damage or witness them being damaged. Let go of perfection and control in particular. Focus on you as best you. And I don't mean be selfish. That's not, we need to come up with a better word in, for, for, in humanity or in society than this word selfish, but focus on being the best version of your can, you can, and trust, I refuse, I would die for my children, but I fuck no way would I live my life for them. Yeah. Not a hope in hell. I love Because anytime I've tried to do that, it has not worked because I, I'll end up resenting them. And the last thing on children, by the way, people often say, you know, I, I do the podcast thing, I'd... I'd write the book. I, 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 I do the coaching thing. I'd, I'd go back and study therapy. I'd do whatever, right? But you know, I've got children now. I go, great. What was your excuse before the kids came along? And you'll find often that it was just a different set of circumstances. And if, by the way, you're not doing this, you're not pursuing your gift because of little Johnny and Sarah, do, do they know that? Do they know you're using them as an excuse? Because if you can imagine them overhearing that in 20 years from now, or bumping into somebody going, oh, your dad, he passed away recently. Yeah, yeah. It's a pity he never became a therapist, but he wants to focus on you guys. And you go, wow. You mean he didn't pursue or she didn't pursue their 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 dreams because of me? No 
never put that on your children. I'm not trying to sound insensitive to people who truly are stretched financially, who happen to have children. It's part of the complex. That's not what I'm talking about here. But find a way to pursue your soul's work or give yourself at least permission to start contemplating moving away from the work that doesn't light your soul up. Because your children are witnessing that. And if you can do it for you, great. If you can't do it for you, do it for somebody, maybe your children. You know, I remember a moment in COVID when I had my day job. It just lands so much for me. Yeah, I, there was enough to do it for me, for sure. But one of a half dozen variables or memories or moments that I recall in, I guess, being courageous enough to question my circumstance and then being courageous enough to take the leap from them and pursue what I believe to be, to your point, I, I think I'm in the room of my soul's work, was uh, I'm working at home because it's COVID. My f- then five-year-old, oldest kid, um, you know, we always call ourselves the fortune cookie family. We're always giving him like, you know, little, like you could do anything, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. And at some point, I don't know, I had said like, yeah, buddy, you know, you, you do just don't settle, do whatever you think is best for you. And then I walked into a room and settled pretty much doing the job that I had before. And that, I remember that moment, like, wow. All right. I, I this is, let me, let me add this to the list, right? I've, I've already mm-hmm. got I've got enough on the scale weighing this side down that it's it's time to really consider taking the leap and going and doing my soul's work. But if I needed any more, boy, that was a big, big driver of it. I don't, you know, I hope that making this move and 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 all the things that we're doing and him observing and being witness or them, I have two of them now, observing and being witness to, hey, dad, you know, whatever uh, successes, failures, whatever, but dad did it. Mm-hmm. You know, he said, I, I'm not going to settle for the norm. I'm going to go do, live life the way I want to because my path in corporate was following the checklist life. My, my family had you know gotten married, had kids, bought a car, got a house, had the job. And by 30, done till 70. Then maybe you have enough in retirement, some social security to walk away. And man, I was going right down that path and it felt really weird to want to diverge from it. And my problem is it took me 21 years to make that jump. So my question with that is, did it have to happen for me or anybody, Scott, the guy in the audience that you talked about? Did it have to happen when it happened? Is readiness predetermined by the universe or can it be ah forced? Can it be pivoted? Can readiness be, be uh, derived? Like I, I think about people go to a conference and event appearing to want to be ready. I know I want that thing, but mm-hmm. I'm not ready, right? I, I won't admit I'm not ready, but I'm ready. I say I am. But then there's that moment when you're just ready and you see those people like, wow, that guy at that conference of 200, he's the one that really went out and just did it because he was ready at that moment. Are you ready when you're ready? Or is there a way to, I, I don't like the word force, but I hope you get my point. To, no, I think, I think, I think readiness. I think readiness is present. I, I, I'm, I'm guessing and I could be wrong. You said it took you 21 years to leave? 21 years out of corporate career. Yeah. When did you start questioning it? Like really questioning it? How many years before that? 15. So 15 years before that, you were questioning it. Yeah. Yeah. So with, not, with some, with, with some fervor, not like heavily questioning, but yeah, with some. Yep. May I ask you a personal question? Any, any that you want. Have you forgiven yourself for staying 21 years? Not specifically. Okay. Not specifically. Maybe something for you. You've you've offered me something today. I'm not here to try to expose anybody, but it's something for us all to think about. If if you feel you have overstayed, I think there's an opportunity to really leverage the overstayedness. Because otherwise it's just chalked down to a waste of time. And where that becomes problematic is one is there's a resentfulness and a, and and therefore a sense of sabotage that we often are unaware of that comes up. Or secondly is now we're going to make up for it. And so we go, well, what's wrong with that? Well, I'm going to do six podcasts a week. I'm not doing five. I'm doing six because Philip, I waited 21 years for this podcast interview um, or for this podcast platform. And I go, yeah, okay. So what is the quality of the podcast? And I don't mean in terms of technically, I mean, in terms of depth for you. So to me, forgiveness is a word, but really processing the staying, because in actual fact, if you process the staying, like really process the staying, like what was it about and why? Because I can feel the tones in you. I can feel, I said, well, well my problem is I, over, I, I stayed 21 years. You didn't say overstayed, you said 21 years. The overstayedness, by moving through that, forgiveness is one element of that. It's a byproduct of, of, of a deeper kind of exploration into that. 
I will put any money you want that you come out the other side of that in six months, 10 years, 50 years, doesn't matter about the details. There'll be a, there'll be, there'll be a giftedness that you come out of that with that someday you look back and go, yeah, that 21 years has helped me see the world the way I do today in a different way. Not to detract at all from what you do right now. That's not the, no. that's not the purpose of it. Um, but going back to readiness, I think readiness is there. And I think the readiness is there before we often perceive the readiness to be there. And I think sometimes readiness can be desperate. So I often have people come to me and go, oh my God, I'm, like, I'm ready. I can't wait six months for break. So I have to come now. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa buddy, hang on a second. I, I, I don't want you in a room near me. <laughs> right? I appreciate your enthusiasm, but you're looking for a light switch. My work is a dial. The light switch can go on and the light switch can go off. The dial is harder to turn all the way back to zero. Is it my job or anyone's job to awaken someone? No, because we can't hit the awake button for them. Um, our job, our, our, our opportunity is to create an environment to tap into the readiness maybe faster than perhaps they will get to on their own. And I have so many clients to reach out and go, I wasn't looking for a coach. I wasn't working, looking for uh, personal growth or development or exploration. But when you spoke on stage, and I hear this all the time, when you spoke, you said something or the way you said it or the way you showed up, I just intuitively felt I needed to step into your work. I didn't even know why. I just trusted it. So that's their intuition. And I find this is the case is our head is, is, is often the problem, but who's going to pay the mortgage and is the podcast going to work? And is anyone going to come and how am I going to replace the money? Our intuition, it's, it's, it's waiting at the door with the bags packed. It's ready to rock. And there's a great little saying, it's in front of, when I put it in the front of one of our journals, we give out, I don't have it to hand, but it's something on the line, you may have heard it, but I, I, most people haven't for whatever reason, but it's a little dialogue between the mind and the heart. And the heart, the mind is saying, you know, um, you know the heart's saying, let's do this. And the, the mind's going, but that's not going to work. And then the heart goes, yeah, but, but what if we did this? And the mind's going to go, yeah, that won't work. And then the heart says, what is this? And then the soul comes in and says, guys, would you just shut up and I'll show you the way? Mm. Well, the two of you just shut up and I'll show you the way. Our intuition, and I'll share a quick story if you don't mind. I had a lady Please. come into a workshop, and I don't know how she did it, but the workshop was kicking off at 9.15, 9.30. I don't like starting at 9. It's a, maybe it's a mental block. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> and I'll start at 7, but I won't start at 9, and I won't finish at 5. And um, I don't know how she did it, but she managed to get around to everyone in the room and shared this tragic story of how she'd been treating by, treated by her husband who cheated on her. And by the time we sat down, finished our cup of coffee, sat down and said, right, guys, my first question is, what, 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 what's brought you here today? And she throws the hand up or starts to talk. And she says, well, I was, I was betrayed and cheated on by my husband in the most horrific manner, in the most publicly you know, embarrassing and shameful manner. And everyone knew about it and everything else. And I didn't know about it. And, and everyone's nodding. I'm thinking, does she know everyone here? And, everyone, and it dawned on me. She just got around to everyone, almost everyone before we started and had told them aspects of the story. And, uh, and she's crying and, and, and I can be super compassionate. There's this deeply compassionate, sensitive guy behind these words sometimes. And I can be ruthless or what perceives to be ruthless. And she finally stopped and I said, great. And I said, um, did you see it coming? And she goes, no. She was almost aghast to the question. She was like, no, I didn't see it. Like, nothing. I said, I don't believe you. And then you could see the anger starting to come up. And she was very, I said, I don't believe it for one second that someone as beautiful and as smart and as intuitive as you didn't have a sense. And she was vibrating with anger in front of me. And I've had that before. And I said, how are you feeling? She was, no, fine. I said, are you angry? She said, no, no, not at all. She wanted to rip my face off. Because just behind anger is that wall of sadness that we just don't want people to see or we don't want to experience ourselves. And I said, Let's assume just for a moment you're really angry and it's directed at me. Let's just play that game just for a second. What's beyond all of that? And she broke, she, she put her head down. She didn't break down. She put her head down and it felt like 20 minutes. It was like maybe two minutes. She lifted her face up and the mascara is rolling down her face with all the tears. And she said, I knew it the day I walked down the aisle. Wow. 
sorry, I knew it the day I met him and I knew it the day I walked down the aisle. And the narrative fed the attention, but the narrative protected her from the truth. Because the narrative allowed her to blame him, which is fine, short term. But long term, it's it's not going to allow you to create the type of traction that you deeply long for in your life in terms of alignment and aliveness. And at the end of that workshop, I, I, I don't say this. You, you can scour the internet. You just won't hear me say this. Her life was transformed in that day. And I mean transformed. You, she lost, she looked 10 years young. Initially, she looked 50 years older. She was bet that. She, it was like shedding this deep story she had inside of this identity. But at the end of the day, at the end of the weekend, I can't even remember how long the workshop was. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter at all. But she just, and when she walked out that room, she kind of floated out that room. And it, she might have gone back a little bit or regressed to some extent. But I knew that she had shed or seen something that she cannot unsee again for the rest of her life. She's been ready for a long time. But I think sometimes we just need to create the environment for the readiness to just emerge. And I think sometimes by providing uh, a place where you simply challenge somebody, but challenge them with a deep sense of intuition and intention, because most coaches, and again, it's not, not shitting on coaches or knocking them. I'm not saying that, but most coaches won't go after that. They won't challenge that. But what we should all should remember is it's, you can always just say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Sorry, I got that wrong. But we all want to be light. So saying, I don't believe you. But I felt that. I felt. Yeah. I felt that I that she didn't believe herself. She was selling it to me. I don't know how we got onto this, but that's ready, readiness. Readiness. It's a great, there's a great parallel though to uh, what you talked about with me and leaving the leaving the job. And did you forgive yourself? I've never heard that. That kind of rocked me a bit. Have you forgiven yourself? I'm sure in in many ways for her, a part of her, you know, uh releasing this was self-forgiveness, right? You know, forgiving herself for whatever it might be. When I thought about that, and maybe for her as well, she may, she may come around to this or may have come around to this, this, uh, this uh, principle as well. But what I, have, what I have said about my 21-year career and the fact that I stayed as long as I did and what I've settled on or what I've said uh, or what I feel truly is a sense of gratitude. And I can unpack that. I met my wife in that 21 years working there, which, you know, led to children. Um, you know, I, I have friends, I met all that stuff. So I feel the sense of gratitude for the fact that I spent that time there. But now when you said that, what I wonder, and it's maybe the same with her story, is gratitude a separate modality as powerful as forgiveness or is gratitude the surface and forgiveness is the depth? Gratitude... Well, so for just 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 backtracking just a second, please. That, that lady admitting for the first time that she knew it years ago wasn't forgiveness. It was the beginning of a path to sure. perhaps forgiveness. Okay, Correct. I agree completely. So it was well it was it was her getting in touch with the truth. The anger that I was experiencing was what was being directed at me is the ball of anger she carries in her body every single day, directed yeah. at herself. And that becomes deeply destructive. That becomes really destructive when it comes to finding new love and new relationships, success, alignment, and all those sorts of things. Gratitude is dangerous. Okay? So we think about gratitude historically or societally as just this incredibly beautiful expression. And that's how we, we, we think about it. And I'll tell you where it's dangerous. It's dangerous specifically in the context of what of how you've brought it to the table. I meet people all the time and they go, yeah, okay, okay, fine, fine. I don't like Vegas or whatever. I always pick them per Vegas. I don't, I don't like, I, I, I don't really like the city, but, but Philip, it gives me so much. This is where my dog was born. This is where my daughter was born. This is where the whatever. And I'm so grateful for the, for the things. Great Gratitude is great. But when gratitude, we use gratitude to overshadow 
a misalignment in our lives, that's where it can become dangerous. We can use gratitude to keep ourselves imprisoned in certain circumstances, in cities, in jobs, in places that we simply don't come alive. Another way of looking at it, and this might be a little bit of a stretch, and maybe I'm I'm, I'm looking for crumbs and I'm, I'm operating on, on, on fumes right now, but if you had to be a, a real softy and, 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 and maybe a little out there is that yeah, you, you you know, you met your wife and, and it's hard to then look at something with with a degree of negativity when it yielded something, and it's a terrible word uh, to use in the context of love and connection and intimacy, but it resulted in something that I hope for you, and I'm sure is, is beautiful and, and, and maybe has led to children and whatever. So it's like being in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a marriage and you divorce and it's very hard to feel into the anger or the dismay or the rejection or the betrayal or whatever resulted in the split up of the marriage when you've got three kids. Because you go, I, I, I can't be, ne- I, I overstayed. She didn't respect me. He didn't respect me. I overstayed in the marriage. But I can't honor that. I can't say that because I've got all this loyalty and gratitude to to kids. And where this becomes so prevalent, when I bring people, and I don't do this all the time, but in one of our experiences, we bring people back to their origin story in order to understand um, the school they went to called life. And they come, I've done this, I've done it. No, you haven't done this, typically. they We bring them back in a way that they start to un- unveil aspects of their lives. Then we bring them in and we do this bridge exercise into why they operate the way they do today around money, around sex, around religion, around all these different things. And they start going, oh my God, that's why why I am the way I am. That's why I am the way I am. And that's writing the script for the future. The, 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 The future you has already been written in the past, not in the present. Your decisions today and how you react to things are as a direct result of how you have been brought into and up in this world. So every decision you're making today that's going to shift your your future is a byproduct of your securities and insecurities from your past. So that's why mining the past is important with the right lens. But here's where I find sometimes people go, yeah, no, but I, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I have a great relationship with my dad and whatever. And I go, but was he hard on you? And then I go, did he love you? And did he hug you? And did he, whatever. I'm, I'm not saying these are actual questions we ask. I'm just spitballing. He goes, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I, yeah, he didn't show me any much emotion, and he never told me he was proud of me. And um, um, but but hang on a second, Philip. Now he's a nice guy, and I'm so grateful that he he actually brought me into this world. And you know, he bought me a bike when I was six. You know, he bought me a set of golf clubs when I was eighteen. You know, he paid for my college. You know, he you know, I said I get all that. Now is that gratitude or is it false gratitude? It's false gratitude because you're trying to use gratitude to to protect. The lens in which you're looking at your dad, rather than saying, I can separate the man from the behavior. I love my dad. My dad did do the best he could, but he was a fucking asshole over here. Or he wasn't, he just didn't give me what I needed as a young man or young woman in this world. And here's why this becomes problematic. I heard you said your, your dad's never said he's proud of you. And he go, is that something? Oh, no, that'll never happen. I mean, no, he's just not built like that. And his dad wouldn't do that. And you know, you're doing it again. How much do you want to hear those words? And people will look at me sometimes and go, more than anything else in the world. Mm-hmm. And they didn't even know until that point how much they still need to hear it, even on the odd occasion that the parents have passed away they're still deep down longing to hear those words and not just the words, but the meaning and the, and, 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 and the intentionality behind it. Let's examine your life and what part of your life right now are you still trying to build in the pursuit and the hope of those very words? And in some cases, it's been the entire goddamn empire. Everything. If I just build this business, if I just get to the Olympics and I've been there with teams, if I just get to play in the Premier League and I've been there with teams and individuals, if I just become a millionaire, if I just become a billionaire, I'm not saying everyone does it for the wrong reasons. I'm saying is often we're driven by these deep emotional gaps or needs in our lives and we're unaware of it. And why this is absolutely key is it often drives us to do things that are not fully aligned to who we are. Then we wake up one day and go, I built all this. Why am I not happy? 
But by being aware of this, now we can start playing football for us, not them. We can go to the Olympics for us, not them. We can be an entrepreneur for us, not them. We can parent for us, not them. I'm not my dad. W- w- what does that mean? I hug my kids 50 times a day because you know my, my dad never hugged me and go, great, that just sounds like you're just doing the opposite. Well, is that not better than no hugs at all? I go, yeah, but what's in the middle? Who are you? Hugs is just an expression. It's the, the essence of you're, you're just doing the opposite or you're doing the same, but very few of us do us in the middle. And truly do us in the middle. We're trying to make up for. Yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I don't know how I got onto that. Uh, Philip, man, I, it doesn't matter how you did. It's it's incredible. I, I mean, I've got a page worth of stuff here that I want to go into, but obviously we can't go into all of it. But let me ask this in the context of, of all of what you just talked about and then bringing back something you mentioned earlier that I wanted to re- revisit. You talked about the left card, I'm uh, sorry, the left pocket, right pocket, and then the back pocket. And I've heard you talk about a few different things from that point to this point that in my mind, I'm interpreting as preventatives, if you will, from going to the back pocket. Is it, in your experience, is it often a certain category of fear that prevents us from going to the back pocket? Is it a desire to control because of what we didn't have from our dad or our mom, or we're not willing to admit to ourselves. I, I guess the core of the question is like, what is it commonly? Everybody's different, but what are some things people can explore or that I could explore that prevents me from going from the right pocket to the back pocket that you have seen in the work that you've done over 20 years? Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful question. I think, I think if I had to simplify the answer to that question, control, by the way, is a whole other conversation. Um, I know I wrote uh, it down. Like that's another podcast. It is a, <laughs> entire other conversation and control is so prevalent in so many driven entrepreneurs and particularly men and they can control often aspects or elements of their business and then where that falls apart or blows up in their faces when they try to take the same principles that they apply in their business to their personal life and they wonder why it doesn't work um control is an absolute illusion it doesn't really exist and it's there for a reason that we control because we want to keep ourselves safe and inevitably it'll run out and there's a whole thing on control um control is is prevalent and and present i should say more rather than prevalent but more present uh, when it comes to this back pocket idea uh, concept but 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 if i had to distill it down I think the simplest way of explaining why I think people don't reach into their back pocket and take this idea and bring it in and birth it into the world, and it could be a, a, an idea that affects one person or a billion people, it doesn't really matter, is I think at its very simplest, I think it is easier to fail doing something that we don't truly want to do or we're not fully committed in than run the risk of failing at something which is an extension of the essence of who we are as a man or as a woman on this earth. And to, to, to give you, and, and I'm sorry for the women who's listened to this, I know your audience is primarily male entrepreneurs and leaders, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you what might appear to be a sexist analogy of this, but it, it's not intended that way. And that is, you walk into a bar and there's two beautiful women sitting at the, at the, at the bar. And I don't mean beautiful as in beautiful looking, beautiful to you. Mm. And one of them you've known 25 years. And in the 25 years you've known her, you've loved her. And to the left of hers is sitting a friend who you've gotten to know recently, a friend of hers, and you know her six months or five months. Depending on your level of awakeness and desperation and just, you've just, you're just woken up one day and you say, I cannot, the pain has suddenly reached past the precipice of my, my, the masks and, and, and the self-protection. You might walk up to the girl you've been in love with for 25 years, but typically in life, we'll go for the person on the left. Because it, we, we, it's okay to be somewhat okay to be ask them for a drink or ask them to go on a date and to be rejected because you're not fully committed. And I know it's not the greatest analogy in the world, it's but it's, 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 a silly, it's a silly fun analogy. And the other thing often in life, just in the, by the way, I think about it, you know, often then there's a guy sitting in the bar or a woman sitting in the bar looking at the door going, oh my God, who's this person? You know, I, I've, got, I've done a dream manifesto. I've described this person and I've written down, they're going to be, you know, eating this and they're going to be vegan and they're going to be six foot high and they're going to have this body shape and everything else. And there's somebody serving them a drink and putting a gin and tonic down beside them. They don't even look at them. They just go, yeah, thanks a million. And they're looking at the door and they're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. And they go, there's somebody right beside you. It could be the love of your life. So we would rather 
either fail or not fully succeed or be fully visible. Visibility is scares the shit out of most people in the world. And they go, no, 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 sure, look at me. I'm, I'm speaking, you know, a hundred times a year. And I go, but what? Sales training. No, again, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I go, great. But what's your idea in your back pocket? Oh, I want to work with, I want to work with dads. I want to work with uh, women. I want to work with people who have had really traumatic child, whatever. How do you feel about speaking all around the world on that? Oh, oh, um, I'm not sure meeting planners would go for that. I'm not sure they'd invite me to go abundance to speak. I, I, I'm not sure there's an appetite for that. I don't think there's a market for that. I don't think I'm qualified. Do you see where I'm going? I do. You're scared shitless of visibility as it relates to the, to the, to the gift. You're not scared of being on stage. You're scared that you'll stand on stage and those people will not love you. The fear of public speaking has nothing to do with, you know, with respect to a lot of the science out there. And science often tells us just simply what we've known intuitively for, for thousands of years, hundreds of years or decades or whatever. But it's the fear that we'll get up on stage, not that we'll make a mistake, not that we will not articulate what it is we want to articulate, is that the audience will not respond and see us and hear us and love us. Um, so I think, I think it's, a, it's a fear of failing at the essence of who you are. Wow. Not just a fear of failure, but a fear of yeah. failure, the essence. If you fail showing up as the essence of who you are, there's nothing left. There's nothing but the darkest, darkest hole, and it has no exit. It doesn't come out in Australia at the other end of, of, of where I'm sitting right now, if Australia's at the other end. It, it, it feels like an abyss that has no ending. However, the reality is, my experience is this, when I help people get, and by the way, sorry, when, when, I, when I witness, I, sh I should say witness, I play a part in it, but when I witness people getting in touch with that gift, it cannot and has not failed to date. Mm -hmm. It might fail as it relates to their expectations. Oh, I've got my gift. Now I want to be a best-selling author. I go, no, whoa, 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 whoa. Who talked about monetizing or, or selling this? We're just getting in touch with your gift. That yeah. may emerge. But just slow down, Tonto. Let's take a break. Let's take a rest. And then let's see how we can bring it to the world. No, but it's got to be a best-selling. You've lost it. Now it's all about ego. It's, about, it's not about just monetizing your credit. It's about measuring your gift. You don't measure your gift. You just bring it to the world and let the world decide what it what it needs to be. I never review how many bums and seats that we put through events. I rarely ever look at money. And when I do, it fucks with my head. And to me, the more I give out, the more I, I bring the conversation that I'm meant to bring to the world. And the more people sit in front of me and I help them just see what's already present bring that wisdom to the, you know, bring that clarity out. Everything works out. Everything. Wow. We only have a few minutes left, but man, I've got a couple of concepts I want to try to touch at least. So I'm going to combine two. We talked about control um, and we talked about ego a little bit. Bit of context. I did a, a uh, mushroom, what is it called? Psilocybin uh, retreat. Uh, <laughs> the person who facilitated it said, yeah, we're going big because I can sense your control issues. You need to you need to let go. So I did five or five and a half grams of mushrooms, which is a lot. Hero's dose, if you will. Uh, and then went through a, a very incredible journey with intention and so on. And what came out of that for me was that the thing, my intention was what's holding me back from being you know, my best version of me. The thing that it was, was my strained relationship with my ego. My take was ego is the enemy. Ego is bad. Squash it. But what I learned was that a lot of the things that I've overcome, a lot of things I've accomplished, and I've, I've heard this said this way, if you were to put a goal across the room and then ask me to go after it, my ego to go after it, my ego is probably going to be the one to get it first. So the things that have protected me, have driven me, have pushed me through you know, fears or whatever has been my ego, and I continually would beat this thing down. So I guess the core of the question, my take, ego is not the enemy. Ego is something that is part of your authentic self that needs to be harnessed and partnered with. What's your take? Yeah, I agree hundred percent. I think it's like fear. People say, Oh, how do I kill fear? If fear if fear if if fear is getting in touch or getting in the way of me going after the 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 lady or the man on the right that I've been in love with for 25 years, if that's essentially what you're saying, how do I kill fear? I go, Oh no, 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 you can't kill it. 
And anyone who's told you can is full of shit or they're lying to you. Or they're actually, they're, they think they can, but they can't. The, 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 the opportunity is to embrace and to dance and to have dinner and to sit down and get to know the fear. And the same with the ego. The ego is present. The, 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 the deny, denial of the ego isn't, isn't awareness. Honoring the ego's presence and how deeply rooted and entwined it is in, in, your, in your psyche is actually the most aware thing you can do. So you journey with it, not beyond it. You don't try to kill it because it's not possible. You become, you, you get into a relationship with this. You understand when it rears its head. <clears throat> you, 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 you understand when, it's, when, it, when, it, when it starts to rear its head and, and, and the patterns around that. It's when I get rejected. It's when I see a bad review. It's when um, my wife's grumpy with me. It's whatever. That's when my, my ego kicks in to try to protect me to whatever, right? So to be, to be, to be in this, not even a dance, but just a movement with the ego and to not to try to kill it. Absolutely. I think that is, that is absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. Incredible. The last quick concept, something that, uh, that I, I prioritize in my life and talk about even, you know, put together a little pamphlet on it. This, so this can, I, can I just, my apologies. Yeah. There's one other thing that's just emerging though, and I don't Please. know if it's directly related, but I'm just going to throw it out there anyway. A lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of driven male entrepreneurs have, have achieved a degree of success based on drive. And, and, and there's a lot of ego tied in sometimes with that. And it's this, it's almost like, let's just use a, a common analogy. It's like diesel fuel. Hmm. And, and, it, and, it, and it's gotten them to a certain point. And there's a kind of, it's an edgy, frenetic, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it better than anybody else. I'm going to do it despite. And it's kind of an energy of moving from what you don't want. And I see this in, in the world of, of, of athletes. I grew up in poverty, so football and, and it's a sport I work in. I've done some work in golf, but, but soccer primarily. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it because I have to. I am not going back to that place. I'm not going back to that, 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 that upbringing or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that energy until something becomes wrong with that energy. And that's not a day or a moment. It's a period of time. That energy will get you out of the slum, so to speak. That energy will make you a millionaire. That energy will build you the business. That energy will get you on a podcast. That energy will help you create a podcast. But it's not sustainable long-term because it's running from what you don't want as opposed to moving towards what you do want. And that opportunity in life is to start using unleaded or electric, whatever. It's not a great analogy, but I'm going to stick with it. And start moving towards the type of conversation you want. And here's the biggest kickback I get from entrepreneurs. You're trying to take my drive away. You go, no, I'm just trying to diminish it a little bit. But that's given me all of this. Look, look what I've, I said, yeah, but you're not happy. You've got the money, you don't have meaning. You've got the satisfaction or the, 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 the success, but you don't have the satisfaction or so on and so forth. All I'm saying is that when you reduce the drive, something can emerge inside of your life because you're not running anymore. Something will come to you. And you'll never have to wake up and try to motivate yourself ever again. It's a different type of energy, but it's not the drive you've been using. I just want to offer that because that is something that was just sparked by what you shared and something that I think a lot of your listeners will probably resonate with in some shape or form. That's a beautiful, beautiful way to bring this to a pretty, pretty close conclusion. I do have one true false question for you though. Gary V. Yeah. I've heard that you had an opportunity to ask him a question. Is this true? The question being, what are you running from with all of your hustle or some derivation of that? True, false. And if so, if true, what was his answer? Uh, true question in front of a, a large audience. Um, Jason Gaynard came to me, who was the host, gave mastermind me the, mic talks. the mastermind talks. Um, great, great guy, great event. And he gave me the microphone. He said, Philip, would you ask a question? And I, I said, I didn't, I didn't have a question. He kind of put me on the spot, not, not publicly, just privately. Sure. And then he disappeared and I looked over and I nodded and he came back with the microphone. This is my memory. It was in, um, in Napa Valley. And I can't remember pre precisely what I said, but I said, Gary, I said, my experience is that people who have such a, such a drive and such a tenacity and some, su such an insatiable need to do all of these things 
pay a price or it comes at a cost. And I, I softened the question. This is back to authenticity. I softened the question. I said, my experience sometimes. And I went, actually, hang on a second. I've never met anyone that doesn't ultimately pay a price for that type of drive. And I, and I, and I, and I, and, and, and again, I don't, don't quote me on this, but it was almost verbatim like this. He said, I, I can't even contemplate the cost of that drive. That drive is so significant for me. I can hardly even go there. I can't even think about it. No, I deeply respected the answer. Yeah. I deeply respected the, the honesty. And my prediction after that, somebody came up to me and said, holy shit, what a question. And, and it wasn't really the question. It was, I, in my opinion, I think it was more the answer. And I think you can ask a question, you know, Dan Martell, and if you know Dan, but Dan rang me and he said, can you just send me your questions? Every time I come across, you've just, you've got these questions. I said, Dan, I'm not sending you the question because why not? Typical Dan. And I'd say that lovingly. And I said, Dan, because I could give you a question in a tube or in the underground, and you can ask the question. I can give you the same question in the Dominican Republic on a beach, right. and it might land somewhere differently. But given the same question in the right environment with the right facilitator, that question will land. And it's important that you have somebody to challenge what fucking comes out the other side, the answer. Not just to hit the bullshit button, but to truly feel into the answer and say, are you, are you sure? Let's talk about that and to, to, to process that. So it's not a case of just giving out the question. So I think the question may have landed. I think his timing was his readiness to, to own it up. But people were shocked. People come up to me and they wanted him to go for another hour because they wanted to delve into that. But my prediction was that Gary would ultimately end up wanting to do work with children. That was my my, produc- my, my, my predic- uh, uh, prediction. I don't know if it's happened. I, I, I don't follow his work. It's not that I have any issues with him. Um, He's, he's a force of nature, but I think he's going to want to do something in the personal realm and it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, it may have already happened. I genuinely don't know. Or it could be wrong. Who knows? I check in with his stuff every so often, just it pops up and there is a, yeah, you're, you're, I don't think your prediction could be called false at this point. Not that he's all in on that, but there's definitely a slant in that direction. You can see the the slide there and the, and the mention of it and the discussion points about. That's so interesting because I've never, I literally have not heard anything from Gary video, audio, nothing for years. Um, so my sense was that's the direction he would end up wanting to go to kind of begin to reconcile some of the inner demons. And I don't mean to speak on behalf of Gary because I don't know. I've met him a few times, but based on his question, I think there's a big cost there. And I hope, I hope he, I, I, I really wish he finds that peace because that's my sense is, is, is someday he'll want to find the peace in all of this. Um, because he's made an impact and I think he deserves some peace around that. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you taking all the way here. I told you, ah, we may not use the whole time, but we did. So apologies <laughs> and thank you for that. What's, um, where, where should folks look for more of you? Is there a social handle, a website? What's best? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on, um, I'm not super active and that's on the social stuff. I'm on Instagram. It's Philip underscore, I think McKernan, uh, philipmckernan.com. Um, and you can join in on these brave conversations that we do every month and there's no cost. If someone wants to jump off the deep end and really go in, Come and come to a, an event called Brave Soul, which is on the west coast of Ireland. We run it once a year, and that's the work I wish I had done twenty years uh, before uh, we started it. Um, and uh, that's a it's a special place to come here and do that work. At the risk of being dangerous, truly grateful for your time here today. So <laughs> I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>